Una pregunta, chicas. ¿Ustedes saben de Bitcoin? Acá, señor. Señor. ¿Qué? Tengo una pregunta. ¿Aceptás Bitcoin? ¿Cómo? ¿Aceptás Bitcoin? ¿Qué es eso? ¿A mí de qué me sirve? En suponer. Sí. Haceme la bien criolla. Esta es una forma de enviar valor entre celular. No está controlada por un gobierno o una empresa. ¿A cómo está el país? Sí. Desde ya te agradezco, mi negro, porque hoy te digo, si hay un pesito, es para comer. ¿Verdad hoy? O sea, ¿se puede comprobar eso? ¿O una idea, una, una locura, digamos, de, de alguien que se le ocurre decir que esto vale tanto? We're in the midst of a serious financial crisis. Major financial institutions have teetered on the edge of collapse, and some have failed. In the Asia market, Asian investors remain cautious today, with many waiting for fresh news on a U.S. government proposed $700 U.S. billion bailout for the ailing financial sector. Over 60 people were arrested in New York this morning during demonstrations marking the one-year anniversary of the Occupy Wall Street movement. Foi na esteira desta crise económica, em 31 de outubro de 2008, que um link para um documento técnico surgiu numa obscura lista de correio na internet. O documento propunha uma radical nova forma de dinheiro eletrónico. Viria a ser chamada Bitcoin e seria distribuída por uma rede descentralizada. O seu criador, uma figura misteriosa chamada Satoshi Nakamoto. Satoshi Nakamoto uh, is the guy that invented Bitcoin. We don't really know who he is. Maybe he's a guy, a girl, a group of people, we don't know. He created the software that implements the, the idea of the paper. And in the end of 2010, when the community got bigger enough to the project to, to stay without him, he totally disappeared from everywhere. Some people claim that he's from the CIA. Uh, some other crazy people say he's, he's from the Illuminati. Some other people say it's like aliens, technology, or it's the artificial intelligence from the future, who knows? <laughs> uh, but because it's amazing how one human being can come up with such a brilliant idea. It is a hard problem to solve. Traditionally, I send you money through a bank, so the bank is a trusted entity. If I give money to the bank and the bank gives you money, then you trust that the money you receive because you trust the bank. You don't trust me, right? So if we take away the bank, how do you trust that I gave you money when software and data and files can be copied? A digital cash electronic system. A way to transfer value through the internet that doesn't have a government or an enterprise or a foundation controlling this technology. Bitcoin is run by the people. Da América Latina à Ásia, a Bitcoin começou a surgir em todo o mundo. Um ano após a sua criação, tinha se tornado um movimento global. O sonho era criar um mundo novo virtual em que o dinheiro circulasse tão livremente como a informação. Eu Tuyu 我其实是在2009年的时候就帮助华为做了第一个内部的社交平台 
，那个时候的目的就是想要去打破这样一个华为内部的信息传播的这种层级模式。所以我自己通过这样一个项目，我发现社交的能量可以改变非常非常多的一些信息传播的模式，同来也会带来非常大的巨变。直到在二零一三年的大概十一月份的时候，比特币的价格在中国已经达到了八千元人民币的一个高峰点。这个东西就算是一个骗局，为什么会有这么大的爆发力？我其实是，当时呢，我就找到了我的另外一个同事，他就跟我大概的从比特币它本身的节点的模式做了一些介绍。我觉得是一个非常非常有意思的创新。我早期是在来自中国的江西一个农村，农村的时候，家里是没有电话的。你要想把你的声音传到到别的地方去，或者说你要想跟一个北京人做交流，那是很难很难的。可是后面有了互联网，就完全不一样了。学完大学毕业之后就去北京上班。当时做完机械设计做了很多年，觉得意义不大这个工作，然后就放弃了。然后放弃了之后呢，就从北京回到我江西找一个方向。我说我后半辈子该干啥？然后就找到了比特币这东西。数字货币和区块链这些东西，并不是现有的一些，它可能都是一些代码、一些理念啊。然后你需要用各门的知识，比如经济学的知识，还有政治学的知识，去填充整个系统。我讲一个故事，在古代的欧洲，如果一个人要给另外一个人寄一个东西，但是这个寄的过程他不想让邮递员偷看，他怎么操作呢？他首先拿一个箱子，把这个东西放到箱子里面去，然后挂一把锁，寄给。另外一个人，这个因为有锁，所以这个邮递员是偷看不了的，因为锁住了。当这个人收到这个箱子的时候，他也打不开，因为他没有钥匙，他怎么办呢？他再这个箱子再挂一把锁，然后叫邮递员寄回给这个人。当寄回这个人拿了之后，他用他的钥匙把他挂那把锁解开，然后再让邮递员把这个箱子寄给这个这边这个人。OK， 这个人因为他有钥匙，所以他能打开。整个过程是完全的加密的，不会有任何人看到。这就是加密通信。A Bitcoin pegou no conceito de comunicação encriptada e combinou-a com um livro de contabilidade. Esse registro contabilístico é distribuído por todos os computadores ligados à rede Bitcoin. O sistema foi concebido de modo que quaisquer novas transações em Bitcoin precisavam primeiro de ser processadas para um sistema informático complexo. A este processo dá-se o nome de mining. Aquí vamos a explicarles y enseñarles la pequeña mina que tenemos en funcionamiento en este momento. Nos van a seguir para darles la explicación.、Eh, tenemos seguridad por razones de gobierno que no es permitido minar. El ruido de las máquinas es muy alto. Y el calor es muy alto. Tenemos aproximadamente 50 máquinas en producción las 24 horas continuas. Ellas generan una mínima parte de Bitcoin diariamente, satoshis diariamente. Estas 
con las máquinas. Estos ventiladores disipan el calor. Son equipos muy costosos y no se puede perder dinero fácilmente. Yo nunca compré un Bitcoin como tal. Eh, los que tengo han sido minados con la minería. Pues eh, por recomendación y porque eh, explicó un amigo, me enseñó cómo funcionaba el mundo del Bitcoin, yo no creía que una máquina fabricara dinero, por decirlo así. Me llamó la atención y me metí en el, en el juego del Bitcoin. Y pues eh, han sido momentos de, de mucha alegría, como han sido momentos de tristeza, porque la volatilidad del precio. La Bitcoinesa es this beautiful band. We are spreading the word of Satoshi all around Argentina. Going to small towns and cities. Some people have said, oh, you're like an evangelist. I like the term because I looked it up. Evangelist is, is like the one that brings the good news. ¿Sabes lo que yo ruego? Que haya una luz. Bueno. Y que recuperen un poco eso, todo eso que se han robado, Quito. Lo que yo te vengo a contar es este dinero de Internet, que no depende de ningún gobierno ni de ninguna empresa en particular. Mira, yo te voy a mostrar, yo tengo una billetera en mi celular. Entonces, yo ya tengo Bitcoin. Te quiero mandar a vos. ¿Querés que hagamos un cambio? O sea, vos me das 10 pesos y yo te doy Bitcoin. Te mando Bitcoin a tu celular. Vale. ¿Lo dale, hacemos? Dale dale. dale. dale, dale. Bueno, entonces, vamos a hacer lo siguiente. Y busques eh, una billetera Bitcoin. Ahora te aparece con el Nomi Wallet, BTC, dale. ¿Qué te? Sí, eso. No. Bueno, sí. ahora ponele... Poner una contraseña larga que vos solo, solo, solo sepas para poder enviar y gastar los bitcoins. Eh, vamos a hacer este cambio. ¿Cuánto querés cambiar? Los 50 pesos. Bueno, vamos dale. A hacer vamos a hacer 100 pesos. Voy a prender el simbolito de código de barras. ¿Está bien? Yo ya sé tu dirección. Fíjate si compara, ¿no? Y ahí dice cantidad en bitcoin. Yo ahora te voy a mandar en 3 dólares con 30 que son 100 pesos. Entonces pongo enviar, ¿está bien? Transacción enviada. Yo eso lo puedo consultar en el libro contable de Bitcoin en Internet. Entonces queda para... un registro. Sí, hay un libro de contable de acceso público que se llama la blockchain. Entonces, ahora si vas a la parte donde dice balance, vas a ver que tenés cero Bitcoin confirmados, auditados por la red, pero tenés entrando 0.30. 513. Ajá, y pasa. Esa transacción ahora está en un limbo esperando a ser auditada por un minero. ¿Está bien? Exactamente. Está esperando. Computadores ligados à rede Bitcoin competem uns com os outros, de modo a resolverem puzzles criptográficos muitíssimo complexos. Os mineiros que produzam mais trabalho a resolver tais puzzles veem o seu bloco de transações acrescentado ao livro de registros contabilísticos. Cada bloco em si contém uma referência aos blocos que vieram anteriormente, criando um registro histórico e mutável de contas, um blockchain ou encadeamento de registros. Este sistema garante que as transações não podem ser alteradas nem copiadas. Para recompensar os mineiros que mais trabalham, estes recebem mais bitcoins. Nisso é sinci, porque, em meio à internet, a presença do mundo é porque, se em meio a uma rede de bitcoins, a presença do dinheiro, a presença do valor, a presença do valor, a presença do valor, a presença do valor, a presença a Bitcoin desencadeou a possibilidade de comércio global livre de regulamentações, censura e restrições legais. Mas para este sonho anárquico se tornar realidade, as pessoas precisam de, com facilidade, trocar o seu dinheiro pelo novo dinheiro virtual. The virtual currency, Bitcoin, took another blow today. Close to 1 million Bitcoins have disappeared. After I heard about Bitcoin, uh, I got so excited about it, I had to read everything I could possibly find uh, about it. And uh, 
I went on, I guess, a Bitcoin binge that lasted for about a week, and I got so sick from lack of sleep, I had to call a friend of mine and ask him to drive me to the hospital, and they gave me some sort of sedative, and I passed out for, I don't know, 18 hours or something, slept a lot. And the next step was to start investing in any sort of business I could find to make Bitcoin easier for people to use around the world. I think it was just good luck that I wound up in Japan. I needed a way to sponsor my visa, so I had an office selling memory parts. And so I told everybody at the office, no more memory, we're focusing on Bitcoin now. So one of my guys translated the entire Bitcoin white paper, and then we had him translate the entire Bitcoin website into Japanese. So we basically helped bring Bitcoin to Japan. Do you have a Bitcoin cash wallet yet? So the money literally went directly from my phone to your phone. You didn't give your name, you didn't give your email, you didn't give your tax ID number. It works anywhere in the world that has the internet. I received my first Bitcoin ever from what was called the Bitcoin faucet. When they didn't have much value at all, it was giving maybe a 10 cents worth of Bitcoin to people. And it was just so exciting. I got tingles all over my body seeing how this worked and I want everybody to be able to experience that. So anytime I meet somebody now, I help them set up a Bitcoin wallet and I send them some Bitcoin. Change your mind on the Bitcoin cash wallet, I'll be right here. In 2011 and 2012 and even 2013, traditional VC firms weren't interested in the space at all. But I knew, there was no doubt in my mind, I knew people were going to start using it as money. And here it is, the science fiction future is becoming real. I just came here for pizza day, so I wanted to enjoy, you know, Belgian beer and a little bit of pizza. Pizza day is the first recorded Bitcoin payments in uh, in the history. So in 2010, uh, 10,000 BTC was paid for two two pizza. That was that only was about 40 bucks. But now, if you think about it, it's a lot more money now. <laughs> 日本で初めてこのカソツカの決済のこのサンタロネのところでピザを食べに来ました。日本ではビットコインコミュニティが毎週1回えっとミートアップをしています。ビットコイナーのコミュニティがとっても厚いし、とても広いです。日本の未来はあんまり明るくなくて何か新しいものにすがりたかったんじゃないかなって思います日本人は意外にギャンブルギャンブル好きなので意外に投機的な意味で始めてる人も多いんじゃないかなと a primeira transação em bitcoins no mundo ocorreu a partir de Tóquio em 2011. Chamava-se Montgox e permitiu aos utilizadores comprar e vender bitcoins online. This is the Cross office building in Shibuya, which was the headquarters of Mt. Gox. At the time, it was one of the biggest Bitcoin exchanges. And for a few years before that, it was probably the only Bitcoin exchange. So the name Mt. Gox, which is kind of a funny sounding name for a financial company, comes from a trading card and role playing game called Magic the Gathering Online Exchange. And it, uh, it first started to, uh, to trade cards for these role playing games. And its original owner, Jed McCaleb, had turned it into a Bitcoin exchange, where he would exchange dollars for Bitcoins, which was a radical idea at the time. À medida que cresceu a procura de Bitcoins, Montgox tornou-se na internet o site cambial por excelência para se fazer negócio. Em 2013, geria 70% de todas as transações mundiais em Bitcoins. I moved to Japan in 2009 as part of my work. I'm a software engineer by trade. I didn't get into Bitcoin really early like some of the people did, but uh, I gave it a shot at trying some day trading and whatnot and, and speculating on the price, and I, I did awfully. 
so I kind of put that down, but I left my money still sitting in Mount Gox. Em fevereiro de 2014, Mt. Gox anuncia que suspende todos os levantamentos em dólares e bitcoins do seu site cambial. Clientes em pânico dirigem-se ao Japão com a esperança de confrontarem o presidente do Conselho de Administração, um francês fugidio chamado Marc Carpelez. At the time, no one really considered that they wouldn't be able to ever get the bitcoins up. You know, they really thought that uh, the exchange was going to shut down for a couple of weeks. Then they'd figure something out, everything would open back up and uh, everything maybe not go back to normal, but at least they would get their money back. Em poucas semanas, a página na web de Mt. Gox desapareceu. Uma fuga interna da empresa revelou que o site cambial estava insolvente e perdera mais de 700 mil bitcoins. There was no news or information coming out of Mt. Gox or from authorities or anything about what had actually happened. So I started poking around and wanted answers. Every transaction that is done on Bitcoin ever is recorded in the blockchain. And I basically realized, uh, oh my God, I'm going to have to pretty much write my own software to trace this. Turns out that, lo and behold, a total of some 600,000 Bitcoins were moved to a set of different Bitcoin wallets that turned out to be the thief. Sometime during autumn 2011, someone gets a copy of Mangox's private keys. And that's the one thing you can't lose if you're in Bitcoin. If someone else has your private keys, they can spend your money. I still don't know who the thief is exactly, but people have been able to identify who laundered the money at least. Ao fim de uma investigação de três anos, o Departamento de Justiça dos Estados Unidos prendeu no norte da Grécia um russo chamado Alexander Vinik. Alegou-se que Vinik proceder à lavagem do dinheiro roubado por Montgox, manobra integrada num esquema que envolvia o desvio de 4 mil milhões de dólares americanos. For anybody that was around in those days, it's like another story out of a science fiction novel, and they stole, what, like half a billion dollars worth of other people's bitcoins? I hope it'll be a learning lesson for the world that unless you're actively trading with your Bitcoin, you should hold them in a wallet in which you hold the funds yourself. So you people should understand the difference between a Bitcoin bank and a Bitcoin wallet. Very, very important distinction so you can avoid uh, bad things like Mt. Gox happening to you in the future. え、こうした政策について日本ではどうしたらいいのかっていうことが決まっていなかった。最初に会ったことは中身がよくわからないので、あの、です。Apesar do caso Monte Gox, o governo japonês aceitou a existência de criptomoedas e reconhece agora na Bitcoin um método oficial de pagamentos. Licencia agora câmbios de criptomoedas e obriga a cumprir rigorosas medidas de segurança adequadas para evitar ciberataques e roubos de fundos de clientes. I've heard there are over 15 licensed exchanges now and probably a lot of others uh, in line to get licenses as soon as they can. Stores, mainly restaurants, but all kinds of places can accept bitcoins as payment quite freely. Japan's probably the blockchain and crypto capital of the world. Hoje, no Japão, as criptomoedas são utilizadas legalmente, tanto como ativos de investimento no dia a dia, como meio de compra de pizzas, bebidas e bens de consumo. 
mas também tem fama a utilização ilegal de criptomoedas. Right now, the regulation of virtual currency industry is still akin to a virtual wild west. I'm the co-founder of BTCC, previously known as BTC China. So we were the very first Bitcoin exchange in China. And I've been living in China for the last 12 years. I got into Bitcoin myself in 2011, uh, way, way back. It seems like so long ago now. It was actually my younger brother, Charlie Lee. He introduced Bitcoin to me. Previously, we were both investors in gold. So we both appreciated the idea that gold has value. From a very young age, we remember stories of my grandparents. I think it was 1949 when they actually fled to Hong Kong and all they had with them were just the hand luggage and then they carried some gold and silver sewn into secret compartments of my grandfather's clothing. So by learning about Bitcoin, we were asking, can something digital have value? It's a new model of ownership. The idea is that I can own something of value, not just a dollar, but hundreds of dollars, or even millions of dollars potentially, but own it by virtue of me knowing the information, knowing the private key, knowing that password. For the first time, money is digitized. A invenção da Bitcoin trouxe ao mundo a sua primeira divisa verdadeiramente global. De repente, a capacidade de se comprarem e venderem produtos em todo o mundo tornou-se acessível a qualquer um com os conhecimentos suficientes. Mas quase de imediato, numa zona da internet conhecida por Dark Web, a Bitcoin começou a surgir oferecendo bens e serviços ilegais. Destes, um dos mais famosos chama-se Rota da Seda, que apareceu em 2011. Silk Road was a website where people could sell drugs or products or services that were vice-like in the sense that if they tried to sell them on eBay or Amazon, they'd get caught out and probably arrested. And it allowed people who visited the site to avoid being tracked by public servants, the police, the FBI. It eventually amassed quite a number of sellers and buyers who were coming on the site to buy marijuana, to buy cocaine, to buy guns, to buy all manner of things. One of the things that people also really liked about it was the payment mechanism, which was using Bitcoin. Unlike a regular payment in a bank, once a Bitcoin payment is made, it's irreversible because there's no central authority to reverse a payment. There's no authority, no person, no system, no company, no exchange that will limit the amount of money sent on a blockchain, which is why Bitcoin got adoption in the so-called dark market. A Rota da Seda era dirigida por uma figura misteriosa conhecida online pelo pseudónimo Dread Pirate Roberts. Em menos de dois anos, arrecadou quase mil milhões e duzentos mil dólares com a venda de bens ilícitos. Em outubro de 2013, tudo terminou. Após uma enorme caça ao homem do FBI e da CIA, um americano de 29 anos chamado Ross Woolbricht foi condenado à prisão perpétua sem a possibilidade de liberdade condicional. El anonimato es porque nos dedicamos a, a perseguir a organizaciones criminales transnacionales, a grupo de personas que se dedica al tema de homicidios, a secuestros, a extorsiones. Nuestras investigaciones les hace bastante daño, dado que tocamos su economía. Bueno, nosotros recibimos un, un mail, un anónimo, en el que nos comunican que hay una serie de personas que ya habíamos estado investigando en fechas anteriores, eh, en el que nos dicen que están ahora mismo utilizando las cuentas corrientes de una entidad bancaria para, para mandar eh, grandes cantidades de dinero a Colombia. Establecimos las vigilancias y nos centramos en un único individuo. O sea, es una persona muy, muy cauta a la hora de realizar sus, sus desplazamientos. Utilizando siempre vehículos de alquiler. 
aumentaba la velocidad hasta 200 km por hora, como de pronto en una autovía te frenaba y se ponía a 50, con lo que, claro, todo el equipo de vigilancia que viene detrás es complicadísimo. Ya nosotros, la intuición es que nos dice que detrás de esto hay alguna organización criminal. Y concretamente, vinculado con Colombia, con algún narcotraficante. Grababa a los agentes que iban por detrás, tomaba matrículas de los coches que le iban siguiendo. ¿Esto es lo que nos hace? Pues paralizar las vigilancias. Y solicitamos o hicimos las intervenciones telefónicas de este señor. Entonces este señor comienza a comentar telefónicamente que el, el mundo de los Bitcoin que es una maravilla por la dificultad que tiene en ser rastreado. Pues procedían a la compra de los Bitcoin desde España y acto seguido ese señor cuando tenían sus monederos eh, virtuales tenían sus Bitcoin procedía a venderlos también por la web. Pero la cuenta donde tenían que ingresar los nuevos clientes el dinero era una cuenta que estaba en, en Colombia. Hemos concluido que al final habrán sido unos 10 millones de euros que lo que se ha mandado a Colombia entre las tarjetas y el, los Bitcoin. El sistema es fácil y hasta que ya procedimos a la detención de todos por el blanqueo. Yo puedo comprar un Bitcoin en este momento y en 15 segundos lo estoy vendiendo en Colombia. Y, o sea, le está dando celeridad, le está dando opacidad y sobre todo le está dando... A nosotros nos produce una dificultad rastrear esas transacciones pillamos realmente muy poquitas transacciones se pueden observar a través de la venta de Bitcoin Illegal activity was actually the foundation of Bitcoin and it was thanks to illegal activity that Bitcoin got used so much and it got used in the mainstream you could say that for a lot of other types of technology For example, VHS. Back in the 80s, one of the apparently one of the very first use cases for VHS was porn. And once people started using it for porn, then people started using it for other things as well. And so these vice-like services, often with new technology, are the ones that are driving adoption. Enquanto alguns se viraram para o cripto dinheiro como forma de fugir à lei, outros e até governos estão a virar-se para a Bitcoin por um motivo muito diferente: a sua sobrevivência. A criação de criptodivisas como a Bitcoin deu pela primeira vez às pessoas na história uma alternativa em grande escala aos sistemas monetários existentes. O interesse pela América Latina foi decisivo. Década após década, países em todo o continente americano sofreram crises económicas umas atrás das outras. So I'm going to show you what we've done to our money throughout all history in Argentina. We've been through five different currencies. The first one was called Peso Moneda Nacional. We changed it for Peso Ley. You had to have a hundred of these to get one of these. But then came the worst one of all. This lasted only for two years and there were bills of one million pesos argentinos. So people were paying in like, how much is this? This is like 29,000, 20 billion, right? And then in 85, you had to have 10,000 pesos of these to get one Austral. Seven years later, we changed to this peso, which is the one that we have right now. But we had a bank run. People went to the banks to ask for the money. The money wasn't there. And since 2002, we've been through an inflation. So at one point, this was worth $100. Now it's only worth $3. La inflación sigue alta, siempre venimos en crisis, en crisis, siempre buscamos precios, estamos acostumbrados a todo, así que es más de lo mismo. Pagamos el triple de gas, pagamos el triple de luz y bueno, expensas ni hablar. Hacemos estas compras, por ejemplo, acá en la feria para justamente organizarnos todas las semanas, economizar. Tiene tres paquetes de espinaca a 30 pesos, que yo vi que la están vendiendo 15 el paquete. 
vendo 20 y gasto 30 y también ponerle a veces me quedo debiendo, todo mucho más caro. La única forma quizá de paliarla hoy en día, para quien tiene que llevar la plata a la casa, pareciera ser que tiene que trabajar mucho. Sábados y domingos trabajo acá en la feria y después los días de lunes a viernes trabajo en un laboratorio como operario de labor de medicamentos. Si hablamos de la dignidad de uno, uno tendría que tener un tiempo para poder estudiar, tiempo para poder estar con mi hijo, tiempo de ocio, algo para tener una vida digna. ¿no? Pero hoy pareciera ser que, que eso lo tenés que dejar de lado. Y eso es lo que te da bronca, te indigna, te deprime, pero después vos tenés que levantarte igual el pie. Se necesita una respuesta. Se necesita una respuesta para que la máquina, para tener por la dignidad de uno. Es una base de datos que tiene la particularidad de que solo se puede dar de alta información. No se puede borrar, no se puede modificar. ¿Está bien? We are in a phase where people want to know all the technical details of how this technology works in order to trust the technology. ¿Está bien? Sí, sí. Nosotros vamos a, a meternos más profundo en cómo funciona la blockchain. They want to know how to check the blockchain online. I mean, I want to know how a hash function works. They want to know how to follow a Bitcoin trail of where the Bitcoins go. Si es una transferencia, yo la tengo que blanquear. Está bueno porque eh, yo podría llegar a exportar para otros países sin tener en cuenta muchos intermediarios y me beneficiaría a mí el trato directo y el pago directo con, con clientes de todo el mundo. En 20 años, la tecnología blockchain ganó. ¿Qué significa ganar y cómo ves la I don't know if the benefits that you gain from a technology like a crypto coin um, are, are good enough to replace central banks. I still have those doubts. What is going to happen, I think, is that you're going to change a different system for a new system that you still don't know what are going to be the ramifications uh, when this new system goes mainstream. Haces click ahí. ¿Y te va a llevar a un sitio web de la blockchain? Ahí recibido. Ahí se una y eh, creo que hay grandes cambios en la parte económica, que yo creo que el día de mañana digamos, va a tender a, a desaparecer digamos, la moneda papel y va a empezar a utilizarse toda esta moneda digital. Ah, digamos. When you have a technology like Bitcoin that allows you to just be part of the international commerce system without knowing no one, just someone from the very poor province in the middle of the country with just access to internet, this guy maybe can develop software and sell it to Apple in the US and get paid in Bitcoin. Right now, the whole banking system, it's pretty expensive when you need to send money going from one country to the other. For example, if you want to send money from Argentina to Uruguay, that are like 50 kilometers apart, the money needs to travel 20,000 kilometers because of the whole intermediaries that are in the middle. What we do is we take these Argentinian pesos, we convert them into Bitcoin, and in one hour or less, you got moved from local currency in Argentina to local currency to Uruguay. So it's a pretty good way to disintermediate all the banking system. You know? This is a painting from Elisa Insua, which is an Argentinian artist. So you can find like peppermint scans or things from the day-to-day -day activity, you know? or even film from Kodak films. In every US dollar bill, it says, in God we trust. We change that to, in God we trust. It's our motto in terms of BTEX. Uh, we trust in code, we trust in math. So it's, in God we trust, in code we trust. We don't trust in God, we just trust in code. América Latina, blockchain y las criptomonedas llegaron en el mismo ferrocarril que ha llegado a cualquier parte del mundo. 
dada la democratización que tiene esta tecnología y la capacidad de romper fronteras geográficas. Sin embargo, cada una de las regiones ha recibido ese ferrocarril de manera diferente. Y observemos que ahí hay una situación importante en el caso venezolano, pérdida del valor precisamente del Bolívar eh, por segundo prácticamente. Eso es una situación dramática para todos los, los ciudadanos y esto ha hecho que se han generado unos flujos de, de unas migraciones de, de personas para diferentes partes de Latinoamérica generará unos impactos importantes en términos económicos y sociales. Pues efectivamente todos los ciudadanos están buscando refugios diferentes para poder subsistir. Y uno de ellos fue tratar de refugiarse en lo que es hoy en día las criptomonedas. A Venezuela tiene ahora una de las más graves tasas de hiperinflación ya más registradas en la historia. Calcula-se que todas las semanas el valor del Bolívar baixa para metade. metade. Para evitar la fuga de capitais del país, el gobierno impuso un riguroso control del dinero, restringiendo el cambio de la moeda local, el Bolívar, por divisas extranjeras. We are working in import and exporting from Hong Kong to Venezuela. Generator uh, stuff of for selling in Venezuela. But when Venezuela start to fall down and the petroleum fall down the price, they put the policy of any dollar you need to fill thousands of formularios and they choose how much money they get to you, like 10,000. And later the government say, no, we only get 500. You need to pay the invoice for 10,000 and it's impossible. Then we start to look in a system to send money from Venezuela to China and I discovered these magic things called Bitcoin. Then we start to look in more deep and we discovered the mining Bitcoin. Almost like 10,000 people are mining in Venezuela. And I hear rumors. They are bigger miners, like 35,000, and I see uh, family to have one miner to survive, because if you go to work in one month, they, you, you're gonna get $2. <laughs> you're gonna mine in, even if it's up all machine, you can get like 0.3 per day. This means in the end of the month, you can get 30, and you only have this miner in, in the house. And I am sure so many families survive thanks to the mining. Existen grandes industriales que sus negocios literalmente quebraron y pues tenían la infraestructura. Tenían galpones que tenían electricidad que no la estaban usando y para ellos fue fácil instalar grandes instalaciones de minería. En Venezuela, un funcionario público, un policía o alguien del ejército se da cuenta que una persona eh, está minando, no necesariamente lo mete preso, pero este, puede ser sujeto de extorsión, le pueden pedir dinero. A pesar de mining das criptodivisas não ser tecnicamente ilegal na Venezuela, a polícia local tem detido mineiros desde o começo de 2016, acusando-os de roubo de energia elétrica, fraude cambial, cibercrime e financiamento de terrorismo. They identify pretty easily the houses that are consuming a lot of electricity because Bitcoin miners do consume a lot of electricity. So police sees these mining operations and the military and the police are starting to mine Bitcoin. And today the Venezuelan government is starting to use Bitcoin to pay for food to send to Venezuela. So it's pretty crazy how Bitcoin can liberate you or even circumvent your own capital controls. O 
hoje não são só pessoas e governos que se viram para as criptomoedas, mas também as próprias instituições financeiras antes ameaçadas por elas. Apesar de alguns no sistema bancário continuarem a desprezar a Bitcoin, cada vez mais instituições estão a interessar-se pela tecnologia por detrás dela. Nós estamos em uma conferência feita tradicionalmente de investimentos de bancos e alguns membros regulatórios e pessoas financeiras tradicionais, mas aqui eles estão ocupados falando sobre as criptocurrencies. So moving on, I mean, cryptocurrency generally, it, it does receive its fair amount of criticism. Um, but when we stand looking at the, the huge possibilities for blockchain technologies, the question is, and I'll start with Roger on this, is cryptocurrency a necessary part of that or is it just a distraction? I think uh, cryptocurrency was certainly the first killer app in regards to this, and I think it's going to continue to be the biggest, most popular use case of these technologies. And that's not to say that they won't be used for lots of other things, but think about it. Now we have a money that works in every single country across the planet. You don't have to give your name, you don't have to give your tax ID number, and it works for everyone, everywhere, regardless of where they were born or what color they are. And I'm sure lots of other things will, that are interesting will be done, but uh, you know, money makes the world go round, and Bitcoin is well on its way to to changing it and making the world go around even faster. À medida que a moda da criptomoeda começou a correr o mundo, as altcoins, uma alternativa às bitcoins, começaram a surgir em lugares diferentes. Mas nenhuma ultrapassa a atração da moeda original. We got 15 grand bitcoin, man, we are going to the moon. <tos> Em 2017, o fenómeno Bitcoin tornara-se dominante e o seu preço disparou. 